ready for Stephen Noda's presentation on his recent exhibition, Ghost Town. A few introductions for the record. As already mentioned, I'm today's host, and um, we also have with us Michelle Hardy, who's curator at Nickel Galleries, and she manages uh, Nickel at noon, and uh, it's great uh, to have her as part of putting the schedule together, and thanks, Michelle, for inviting me to be the host today. Marla Halstead, some of you will be familiar with, and uh, she's here. Thanks, Marla. Uh, Front-end manager, always co-host for Nickel at Noon. We have today's speaker, who I'll be introducing shortly, Stephen Anoda. And just a note in case people that are with us can't stick around for the whole of today's presentation, next week we'll be having Mary Beth LaViolette, and I'll give more information on that at the end of today's talk. Most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta. This is the Blackfoot, comprising the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Satina, Stony, Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, the Bezpur, Wesley First Nations. We would also like to acknowledge that the city of Calgary is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. For those that may be with us for the first time today, Nickel at Noon, lively discussions on art and culture every Thursday during the regular academic year from noon until 1 p.m. For this year, that was September 10th through to December the 10th. It's always free. You register on Eventbrite. There's the web link here. You can also follow for regular updates on Fitter. Uh, Fitter, that's a good one. Hey, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, uh, or subscribe to our mailing list. A few house rules, please. Uh, Keep your microphones on mute uh, until the end when we're happy to hear from you and take any questions, comments, and so forth. Marla also uh, assists in uh, keeping an eye on people's uh, microphones, so don't be surprised if uh, you accidentally knock it on that she might turn it off. I'd also like to highlight that we do record these presentations and it will be subsequently posted on the website. Participants' names in the chat are not included in the recording, but if you do uh, elect to ask a question, then your voice will be recorded as part of that. So this just is the slide for next week, and um, this is really just a, uh, a placeholder while I go back through to give my formal introduction to, uh, to Stephen and Noda. And so the reason that I'm here as host today was part of my privilege of having Stephen's exhibition at Founders Gallery at the start of this year. And so some of you will know that the University of Calgary Founders Gallery is located at the Military Museums down on Crowchild Trail. And our mandate is to program art that addresses conflicts from both a historical and contemporary perspective through art and heritage with artists from across the world at all stages of their careers. And this particular year, 2020, is the 75th anniversary for the end of World War II. And so we dedicated our program to that. And as part of it, Stephen Anode, a well-established uh, artist with a primarily a sculptural practice and installation art in Calgary. Also, we've had the pleasure of working as colleagues uh, in the Department of Art, uh, where Stephen is uh, currently the technician. And he's gonna be talking about his Ghost Town project that's uh, toured across Canada. Last year, most recently, it was in Ontario, at the Royal Ontario Museum. And it was uh, fabulous to have his work at Founders Gallery for what has actually been the largest iteration and installation of this project to date. It was a real disappointment that we had to truncate the show due to COVID and uh, accordingly reschedule his talk. So without further ado, hopefully Stephen's ready to uh, share his screen and swap over. And uh, we will have uh, 10 minutes or so at the end of today's presentation. I'll be able to stick around a little longer if, uh, if demand is there. So without further ado, Please, everybody, welcome Stephen Anoda. Hello. Oh. <laughs> so here I am. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks, Dick and Marla and Michelle, for this opportunity to talk to everyone. Um, I'm going to just jump right in and, and do my introductions as I go with this work. So here we go. Hoping you can see that. Not quite yet. I can see you, but uh, can't see your presentation. Let's just try that again. How's that? Looking better. 
Great. Okay, perfect. So, um, Ghost Town. Uh, basically, this is, this is a part of a much larger project that I've been working on for a number of years um, that deals with, uh, deals with a number of issues surrounding the Japanese-Canadian internment during World War II, or more correctly, the Japanese-Canadians expulsion from the coast, their detention, and subsequent dispersal across Canada. Now, this was pretty difficult work for me to confront. And so these, these are the titles of the usual presentations that I give um, as far as slide talks go. Um, pretty stuffy and kind of glib. Um, so scratch that. Um, I'll be retitling this as we go along. Um, the internment and my family's involvement with it are, are topics that were extremely fraught for me personally and problematic for me as an artist for a, a number of reasons. Um, my work had not been overtly political before, and it took me a long time to deal with this content with something other than uh, rage. Um, so to do justice to the content, I felt I needed to do something um, with the viewers in a more meaningful dialogue, um, not, not just shout or scream. Uh, the work has since have considerable legs and it's transformed each time I've shown it. So I'd like to share with you how I got to this iteration in the Founders in February and some of the history that I researched. So um, instead, I'm going to call it representing personal solutions to expressive problems, or you can flip that, uh, expressive solutions to personal problems. Or how I figured out a way to say the things that I needed to be said. So Ghost Town at the Founders Gallery, is, as Dick mentioned, uh, is, was at the military museums. And when Dick first proposed this to me, I wasn't sure about how this work would fit in specifically with a military museum. But as he, as he mentioned, um, the mandate is to talk about the history and social context of conflict and our responses. And within my work, it's not just about, uh, about what happened to the Japanese Canadians during war. Um, part of it has to do with themes that were developing my work about overcoming and about hope. So if we take a look at that first panoramic of the, uh, of the work, this beautiful, beautiful photograph by Dave Brown, um, what you see is, is the basic installation of the Ghost Town uh, project. It's uh, a series of die cut tar paper shacks, in this case, 600 of them, the, the largest number that I've ever shown. And on the wall behind is projected uh, a time lapse uh, animation of the moon going through its, its cycles. So what you would see is uh, essentially, this is a screen capture of uh, the video component. It runs for 29 minutes and 30 seconds, slowly going through the phases of the moon, one minute for each day of uh, a typical moon phase. Um, and so when you're, in, when you're in the installation, you only see that every time that you look up, you'll see that it's, it's slightly changed. Um, it, it acts as a timekeeper within the space. So these are the scale models. They're scale models of one and two family standard shacks that were used for housing the interned Japanese Canadians in BC. Um, this was a shack that was designed by architects for the BC Security Commission, um, which was uh, the, the, the body of, uh, of folks from the BC government who were overlooking the internment. So I'm gonna show you a couple of other close-ups of this. As you can see, each one of these is, is slightly different. Uh, what happens is a crew comes in and helps me um, construct these and then lay them out. So here's the, uh, here's the crew. Took uh, 10 friends and family, um, Dick Averns and uh, the crew from the founders. Uh, it took us basically three days to lay out all 600 of these and set up the video. That's uh, the most shacks that I've ever had a chance to, uh, to put up. Now these, I like to call them shack bees, um, are an integral part of the project. It's a it's sort of an, a relational event that happens at the beginning of each show. 
And it's one component that involves direct discussion with our audience, with the audience, and the participation of the audience in the actual making of the work. So in the past, this has included you know, artists, gallery people, um, just members of the, the general community, quite a, quite a number of people who knew very little about the internment. And on a couple of occasions, uh, uh, some of the Japanese uh, Canadian elders who, who went through the internment. So this, is, this has always been a chance uh, for not only a lot of hard manual labor here with your fingers, but, uh, but um, interesting discussions about not only art, but uh, what happened during the internment. So here's a reverse view of the exhibition. Um, looking back uh, across, the, the, across the floor, you can see that the, the shacks basically filled that large room uh, at the founders. And in the back, you can see uh, some of the imagery from um, the vestibule show that, that uh, uh, Dick arranged, which was, I think, a, an, an amazing part of, of this iteration of, of, the, uh, of the exhibition. Um, and it contained uh, a series of images and artifacts uh, that related to the Japanese Canadian experience leading up to and including the internment. So um, from the door, this is one of the views that you would see. So um, essentially uh, it, it, it showed um, uh, archival images, artifacts from the museum's collection um, and uh, that detailed the Japanese Canadians in a community involvement in the armed forces during World War, uh, the World Wars, as well some of my own family's artifacts. So in the foreground there, you can see a, a small wooden box inside of the vitrine, which is actually used for for shaving dried fish, and behind that the rice pot. Well, these artifacts were actually things that went through um, went through the internment, were taken from. Vancouver into the, the camps uh, during World War II. So what I'd like to do next is to talk a little bit about uh, what my general method is. And part of that is, is often starting with a great deal of detailed research and the production of miniatures or maquettes as a first stage before any sort of an installation might happen. And so uh, there's a little bit of a story behind this. For, for many years, my work had based itself in, uh, in traditions of Western art. And uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, I was asked during my defense by Arthur Nishimura what, uh, what influence Japanese art had on my work. And it, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have an, an immediate answer to that. It's kind of amusing, I suppose, or, or frightening in retrospect if you're a graduate student who's going through the mill right now. There's always a blind side. To, to what you're doing. And what I realized that there was a real influence there that uh, early on I'd been surrounded by imagery um, of, uh, of Japanese culture. But interestingly, it's always come through uh, my work through a filter of, of Western culture. Here's an example, all right? So this is, uh, this is Claude Monet. Wonderful. On the right, you see his bridge over a pond of lilies from 1889 or 1899, um, which is considered part of his Japoneserie, right? So I was always influenced by, by images of, uh, of bridges. And I was, I was interested in looking at how the Japanese approached bridges. And what I ran across when I looked up Japanese bridges was actually Monet. I ran across the series of paintings I ran across, for instance, his collection of, uh, of Japanese prints, one of which is the Hiroshige that uh, is on the left, with an image of a bridge in the garden. In fact, Monet uh, built uh, Japanese vistas and uh, Japanese structures in the garden at Giverny. So there's a picture of him on his bridge um, in, in Giverny. There's a lot of really interesting things about this. Uh, the bridge was, was constructed in very much a traditional manner with a traditional form. If you go to Giverny today, however, what you'll find is um, the bridge on the right here, which is, uh, according to the pamphlets, um, an exact replica of 
Monet's bridge. But you can see that there's a slight difference if you take a look at the archival photograph on the left there. What I discovered was they'd done something which is kind of familiar to us these days. They flattened the curve, which is safer, but it's a change and it's not an identical reconstruction. And it, it might go some ways to explaining why um, why painters today who go to Giverny and try to uh, to uh, do homages to the the, uh, the master uh, find that their bridges aren't quite right. So this, in the end, went into research for a, for a maquette. Uh, this is a, this is a, a bridge built basically on the plan of Monet's bridge at Giverny. Um, it was, was twinned with two abutments, which were leftovers from another piece that I'd been working on, a series of of chairs. Now the chairs uh, were the first time that I actually con uh, confronted you know, family uh, history. So this was the current members of my family uh, represented as chairs. Uh, and what I realized was they, they were the ones who had actually come through uh, the internment or the ones who uh, had joined us afterwards. Uh, this, this includes my own personal family, um, Katie and my kids. Um, and so there they are, they're, they're, they're all uh, chairs cut from a single block of wood. Beyond that, I started to look at other aspects of, of family history. Um, and in particular, I was looking at the people who had come through uh, the internment. Uh, two of the things that have always interested me in, in producing my work is, is to deal with material in a way that's meaningful. And so what these are, are miniature blackbirds. They're about an inch and a quarter at most uh, wide, small, small carved crows. Uh, and they're mounted, uh, or they're, they're, they're cut out of blocks of uh, maple and mounted on uh, posts of bamboo. So references to, to two uh, national influences in, in, in my, uh, my own life. Um, there's one crow for each one of the people in my family, uh, immediate family, who came through, uh, came through the, the internment. But what I found was that it was really about what happened afterwards. Uh, this is really a, a, a kind of a metaphorical representation of, of the diaspora, what happened afterwards. So after the, uh, the, the internment, uh, in 1946, when the camps were starting to close, the, the Japanese Canadians were either deported, there were 4,000 of them deported, or they were uh, made to resettle outside of BC. So everyone who was Japanese Canadian living on the coast, pretty much, uh, except for a few exceptions, um, were, were made to disperse. So a few things about what happened during during the uh, the internment? The Japanese Canadians' property was sold off, and it was sold off at less than a quarter of its worth during the war. And then the money was placed in trust at no interest, and monthly uh, withdrawals were made to pay for the camp housing, so to pay for the internment itself. So there was nothing really for the Japanese Canadians to go back to on the coast. Um, there was uh, a number of of problems with this. The, the, the franchise, for instance, they, they weren't citizens. The, the, the franchise was or a federal uh, ability to vote federally was granted in 1949 at the same time that they were finally granted free movement. Um, the redress and apology for the internment happened in 1988, you know, far too late for most of my grandparents. So there was a lot of fallout uh, to the experience of the internment. Um, whether for fear or for shame, after the war there was an urge to fit in and part of the, what happened as a result of that was a loss of language and loss of community because most Japanese Canadian families didn't settle together as they had been in Vancouver. They, they, they spread out in each of the communities that they, uh, that they entered into. So the question became in my work, you know, how do you deal with that kind of event? How do you deal with disaster? How did, how did my parents and my grandparents deal with it? Um, how do you deal with loss of culture? 
So I started to look back at what images um, influenced me. And this, this was always a favorite. It's a favorite of everyone. This is, uh, this is Under the Wave off Kanagawa or The Great Wave by Hokusai. Um, playing around with it, I decided that what really affected me in this was uh, the way that this massive wave towers over, or, over the humans in the image. It's such a powerful uh, composition that I decided that I would try to use that sort of compositional device in one of these diorama pieces that I do. So that's, uh, if you stretch out and cut it into sectors, this is, this is the way that the, the, uh, the great wave looks if, if it's spread over say two feet. And this is the piece that resulted. This is, this is my own version of the great wave from 2015 which combines a number of things. It's, it's uh, attempting to, to um, use that, that, uh, that effective asymmetrical composition with a set of, of uh, new images. Now, what you're seeing here are tiny little laser cut and hand assembled uh, shelving units. Uh, there's, there's about 30 of them. And where this, this uh, image came from is from a couple of sources. Um, over the years, as uh, my parents have passed and some friends' parents have passed, I've become, uh, it's become a recurring motif that I, I spend time clearing people's houses. And uh, on one occasion, uh, with my friend Kurt's uh, parents' house, uh, we went down in the basement and I realized it was full of these canning shelves, these, these shelving units, with, uh, with materials put away for a rainy day. And so that's, that's part of where this, this imagery came from. But the other part, you'll rec recall, uh, is uh, after the tsunami uh, in 2012 in Japan, uh, one, of the, one of the major images that came out of that for me was this disaster management center um, at uh, Minami Sanriku, uh, where the disaster management uh, um, staff had stayed there as the waves came in and had been basically washed away. And all that was left is this, this, uh, this shelf-like shelf -like structure. So that's, that's basically where this came from. So as you can tell, um, one of the things that goes into to my work is a lot of front-end research before I end up being able to, to, to sort of galvanize that into, into imagery. So what I began to do was a lot of family research and then uh, specific archival research uh, into the, the Japanese Canadian internment. And as I said, this, this, was, uh, this was a topic that was really difficult for me. I'd, I'd sort of danced around it for years, trying to find a way of, of uh, incorporating this into work. And it seemed to me that it became more and more important as uh, as my parents were aging, as my grandparents had passed, uh, to be able to to gather this this history, this uh, this this important uh, set of memories, and in some way, um, in some way, incorporate them into my work. Now, at the show uh, in Founders, you, you might have noticed from that first uh, first slide at the back end of the the, the first room are these images, which are blow-ups of my grandfather's uh, registration card. I'll be coming back to those in, in just a second. That's my grandfather in the middle, proudly standing in front of the, or at the side of the Powell Street Bakery, where, where, uh, a bakery that he actually owned um, and ran for, for you know, about 15, 20 years before, uh, before the internment. So here he is again. Uh, what I realized at the time of the, the exhibition was that uh, my grandfather's image here is, uh, he's, he's my age when this is taken. And it, it, it sort of set me back to think, you know, what would I have done? How, how would I have uh, reacted if this had happened to me? Um, interesting thing, you, you might notice that uh, the, the date there is April 3rd, 1941. Um, hostilities actually officially began with Japan uh, with their declaration of war in December of that same year. So this, uh, this was in preparation for the upcoming war um, 
the Japanese were, were registered. So at the back, you can see this is a, this is the, the rest of the registration card. So these are the registration notices. Um, one of them from the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center in Burnaby. Uh, the other one is from the archives of uh, the British Columbian uh, newspaper in New Westminster. Uh, and this has to do with the, uh, with the uh, preparations again for the internment. Um, Japanese nationals were uh, made to uh, register and eventually people from the outlying areas of uh, Vancouver were, uh, were kicked out of their homes. They had about 24 hours of notice. Uh, you might notice on the right hand side, uh, Marpole is one of the, the named uh, villages or towns. And that's where, my, uh, that's where my father's family were living. So this is a slide from the Nikkei Internment Memorial Center in New Denver, uh, BC. It's a, it's a great little uh, factoid list of, of uh, giving you the timeline and the numbers. Um, so a total of 23,512 people of Japanese origin were registered by the RCMP. Um, basically, nearly 20,000 were interned uh, in various projects throughout Canada. Now, some of those were uh, but the majority of those were actually in BC, in uh, the interior, uh, in, in internment camps. And the other places were placements on sugar beet farms, for instance, in Alberta and Manitoba, um, and various road crews and uh, public works projects. So. The camps themselves were actually built by the Japanese Canadians. So this is a picture uh, that was in my, my grandfather's collection of some friends who were uh, probably building the camp of Popoff where, where uh, my grandfather was interned. When people were, uh, when people were rounded up, they only had a certain amount of time to, to take what they could. Um, rice was eventually available, right? Uh, the, the, the blue thing underneath is actually a, uh, it's actually a, a, a blanket or comforter that my grandmother made out of uh, old kimonos. And the little pamphlet on the right is, uh, is a, a really, really racist tract <laughs> called Questions of, of Oriental Immigration, written by uh, uh, later Prime Minister, Prime Minister uh, Robert Borden. Right. The term ghost town actually uh, was used by my grandmother um, and many people in her generation for the internment uh, internment experience, but it came from the fact that a number of the sites were real ghost towns, and this is one of them, Sandon, uh, that's up uh, in the mountains away from the, uh, the Slocan Valley in BC. So this is Popoff, where, where my father's family were interned. They were interned in a small um, single shack, one of the little ones there, um, and my grandfather was the, the town baker. This is an image of the first uh, internment camp that was built, it was called Tashmi. Uh, this was sent somehow uh, from Tashmi to, to pop off to my, to my grandfather. Um, interesting thing, uh, you'll notice that there's a guard tower um, in the background there. Uh, as far as I know, Tashmi was the only one of the interior um, internment camps that, that actually had a guard tower. They, they were so isolated that it didn't, wasn't really necessary. And another thing that's interesting is uh, the word Tashmi isn't for the location. It was named after the three uh, British Columbia security commissioners, Taylor, Shuras, and Mead. And it always amazed me what, what kind of people name a detention camp after themselves, but yeah. who am I to judge? So this is, this is one of the locations, Rosebury, where my, where my uh, mother's parents were uh, interned. Um, you can see it's really an idyllic place, but uh, in, in the case of Rosebury, um, the camp was right on the shore of the, of the, uh, the, the lake, Lake Slocan. And uh, when the uh, wind blew from the west and the south, uh, basically all the weather came straight across the shore and it's into the, the camp. Um, now the camps themselves were, were actually knocked down in, uh, in 1947, um, 
in uh, 2009, Mark Hutchinson and myself, uh, he kindly agreed to come out and help me uh, do some on-site research in the Slocan Valley. And we took a, a whole number of pictures and uh, did a, a number of measurements of the structures. So this is possibly um, the remains of a foundation of a, of a bathhouse that the, the community at uh, Rosebury built in 1943. It's now completely overground, overgrown. So in New Denver, um, there's a place called the Nikkei Internment Memorial Center. Uh, it, it's a fantastic uh, historical resource and kind of a pilgrimage for, for a number of people of, of uh, Japanese Canadian descent. Uh, it's one of the very few places where you can go and actually see, uh, see the original shacks uh, preserved. So this is their, um, this is their, their administrative center, but it's also a shack preserved from the outside um, in the condition that you would have seen it in in 1942 when the, when the camps opened, uh, New Denver being one of the major camp sites. So that's a, another side view. You can see that the, the, the boards were, were uh, you know, very rough hewn. Uh, as well, they were green when they were, when they were installed. And so they, they shrank, especially during that first winter of 1942, uh, when uh, the, the exterior had experienced a, a record snowfalls and <laughs> from the interior, they were heated by potbelly stoves. So uh, with, with those two uh, effects, uh, the, the, the shacks actually became uh, no, no longer windproof. Over, uh, over the next coming years, people managed to scrounge up things like cedar shakes to put on the outside. But this, this gives you a sense of what the interiors were like. And I, I was particularly struck by uh, that, that little sled that's there, which I don't believe was really a, a child's toy. It was, it was used during the winters for various other things. And I, I can confirm this because of uh, an anecdote from my mom. But during that first winter, her, her mom, my grandmother, sent her out to, to gather uh, water at the pump. So she put a couple of buckets on a sled with wooden runners and ran down to, uh, ran down to the pump, filled, filled up the buckets. And then on the way back, as they sloshed around, uh, the, the runners got stuck in the snow. And as she yanked on that sled, uh, she dumped out about half of the water. Um, and after that, basically, when she finally got back after a half an hour, um, my uh, grandmother sent her back to, to get more water. So uh, yeah, that was one of those things. It's, uh, it, always, it always stuck with me. The piece that I did from uh, the Ghost Town Suite that, that relates to that is this rice sled. Uh, so uh, two buckets on, a, on an old fashioned sled on a bed of rice in this case. Uh, in place of the snow, the soundtrack of a of, uh, sled being dragged uh, through the snow. So the result of, of the, uh, the measurements we took was uh, a series of, of uh, plans uh, for the, the, the shacks. And this is the one that was um, occupied by uh, my mom's family uh, in Rosebury. You can see that they're, they're absolutely tiny. Um, it's one thirty-second scale, but these are about um, 17 feet long. Uh, so if that gives you a sense of it. Uh, in, in this shack uh, would have been my, my grandmother and my grandfather and uh, their four daughters. Now, strangely, uh, some of these shacks are still on site in, in, um, in uh, New Denver. They've been moved around. And one of the original internment um, parts of the town of New Denver was called the Orchard for obvious reasons. It was in an orchard. And some of these have now become vacation cottages and permanent homes. They've been added onto and uh, renovated and, and um, combined. The first piece from the uh, first piece from the um, the ghost town suite that I made from these plans was actually this one, the Rosemary Single, which has a, a soundtrack inside of uh, my mom washing rice. So this is an image of Rosemary in that first winter. 
And this is the result that I was talking about. When you visit New Denver, you can see that uh, the, the shacks themselves are to a large extent uh, not weatherproof, they're, they're, they're see-through. And this also results in, uh, in an anecdote that came from uh, my mom's family about uh, in that first winter, my grandfather managed to get a hold of a couple of rolls of uh, tar paper, but snow was so high on the outside and the weather was so fierce that he ended up putting it up on the inside uh, at first, which was uh, a, a pretty typical uh, reaction to this apparently. Um, and so you can imagine what those, those places were like, uh, lined with tar paper and black in the middle of this, this roaring winter in uh, the BC interior. That was essentially why I decided to, to build these shacks out of tar paper, not, not just for the fact that, uh, that the tar paper shack is, is a, a persistent image throughout these sorts of, of uh, communities, if you can call them that. Uh, detention centers, refugee camps, shanty towns, uh, they're all full of tar paper shacks. What I did was I um, actually drafted them out and figured out a folding system, sort of like a cardboard box. Uh, and so they're, they're assembled using tab and slot uh, method. And they were cut out of tar paper, as you can see. And this is what they look up, look like up close. There's a number of other iterations of, of this project um, that I'd like to show you a few images from. Um, Ghost Town is, a, is, is actually a much larger project. And it's, it's, uh, much of it is based on family anecdotes and anecdotes. So uh, you can see the, the sled in the background. This was the first iteration in um, 2012 at the Stride Gallery. Um, so one of the things that I was, I was trying to do was to avoid the sort of anger. So the, there's a, a kind of minimalist aesthetic that's, that's incorporated through most of the work in, in uh, this suite. Uh, you can see that there's a, uh, a ladder with a ball at the top that's called Ladder to the Moon. And that's originally where the, uh, the, um, the moon projection came from. It's actually a part of, of that piece. Um, the piece came from a couple of different sources. Uh, first, um, my father always had a rather um, problematic relationship with ladders. Uh, I remember him falling off of ladders a couple of times when I was when I was a kid, uh, and he also used to tell about these these horrible rickety orchard ladders that were used uh, during the internment. Um, he was a, a, a sort of a young teenager, 14 years old, let's say, um, and at the time they were dragooned. All the, the young young boys were were dragooned into picking fruit in the interior of BC. So be, they'd be put into um, state trucks, the back of state trucks in in uh, around four o'clock in the morning and run through uh, the, these mountain roads to the orchards uh, so that they would be there by daybreak and they could start picking fruit. And they would pick fruit until until sundown and then be loaded back in the trucks and, and taken back to the camps. So he always remembered a couple of things from that, that uh, experience. One was the fact that the orchards were overrun by rattlesnakes and the other was that he kept falling off of these ladders. The other place that this ladder came from was uh, from my daughter, Madeline, who asked me a question one morning. Um, if you built a, uh, a ladder tall enough, could I climb it and touch the moon? Which I thought was, no, that's adorable. That's amazing. Um, but on the other hand, it was, it was an interesting proposition. It was it, ladder to the moon is, a, uh, is actually a, a phrase that was used around the turn of the century for impossible pursuits. And so for me, it became uh, an image that, that dealt with overcoming, with uh, being able to actually achieve something. And so uh, it became a, an image of, of hope. And so it was, uh, the, uh, the moon itself was mounted directly on top of the ladder. So this is a, another iteration. Um, in the few times that it was shown over, the, over those years, um, 
each time it was the, the latter and the ghost town uh, shack arrangement that, that came together and they became a kind of potent pair uh, for the installation. And this is this is an installation at uh, um, Plug-in in, in Winnipeg in 2013. Later on, I was uh, I was invited in 2014 to to show this suite of work at uh, at the National uh, Nikkei National Museum in Burnaby, BC. Um, it's always been a, a pleasure that that I've been able to go places where um, often like the context was, you know, very well explained for those who were who were visiting uh, the exhibition. And in, in this case, it became a very stripped down version with the uh, with the projection on the wall and uh, uh, the layout on the floor. Um, part of the reason for this was the um, and if you're ever showing at the DK National Museum, the main space um, is exactly ten feet tall. Unfortunately, my ladder is about eleven, so uh, I, I couldn't put it up there. At the same time, they arranged for me to be able to to do an on-site um, uh, installation in New Denver at the Cohen Memorial Gardens, which were installed in, in memory of, of the internment. Um, and so uh, at the Nikkei, inter at, uh, the Nikkei Internment Center um, helped me to arrange a, uh, a shack bee with uh, the, the people in New Denver um, to produce the shacks for this, for this piece. Um, which was a fantastic experience. There was a mixture of, of longtime residents and uh, uh, vacationers and cottagers. And this, this is one case where I, I actually got to carry on a conversation with uh, one of the New Denver elders. Uh, New Denver is actually one of, the, uh, one of the exceptions that I was talking about. Um, there were people who were allowed to stay at New Denver. Uh, Japanese Canadians were uh, allowed to stay at New Denver. And I believe there was about 30 families that, that could actually, were, were actually allowed to stay. And, and so there is an old time um, Japanese Canadian community actually centered around, around that town. Finally, as, as Dick mentioned, the last time that I got to show it was at the uh, Royal Ontario Museum. Um, in 2014. So this, this is the version uh, that was in conjunction with uh, um, being Japanese Canadian. And finally, coming back to the founders, um, I often ask myself, you know, what, how is it that I'm still showing this work, you know, eight years on maybe uh, 11 years since I started it. Um, and to me, it still remains relevant. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that it's still uh, effective for people. Um, and after all, you know, there are shanty towns, there are detention camps, there's refugee camps still around. So that's, that's it. Thank you all for, uh, for joining me. That's great, Steve. Thanks ever so much. So um, open to questions here. Um, I have been monitoring the chat and having a couple of conversations with people along the way. So um, feel free to uh, add any uh, questions into the chat, but um, I'll start things off. And I will also reiterate that if people wish to um, unmute themselves, we're also open to um, having you converse with us directly. So Steve, really appreciated some of the expanded context for other projects and the, a lot of the extended research from Japanese culture that, that predates the actual commencement of putting this work together. And so um, I have, uh, have one question and in referring to your inclusion of rice, in some of your earlier installations. Food, obviously uh, an important thing for all of us. And in terms of shelter, there's a number of different iterations of, uh, of form that have come together there. And I remember in 
putting together the interpretive exhibition for your project. And uh, thanks for sharing those slides to give the context with the, with the rice cooker and particularly the small child's quilt that was made from uh, kimono material. Um, we had the conversation around how uh, the only real artifacts that were left for your family to, to loan to the exhibition were around, for, that were extant from the time, were the food materials, the references to shelter, and then to clothing. And of course, all of those three things are, are vital for uh, our protection. So I wondered uh, if you wanted to expand more on clothing or any other projects that you might be thinking of that would pick up on that. Um, or, uh, or just build on that uh, a, a little for us. Well, it's a, it, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I I, I was struck by that that uh, that there wasn't a lot that was left. You know, there wasn't a lot that, that came through the the whole experience. Um, uh, there are a few battered photo albums that managed to be taken along. There were uh, there were um, there was a writing set from my, my, uh, right. my maternal father, which, which was another one of those things. And, you know, th those really do speak to what are the basics, right? Um, that, that you be uh, clothed and fed. And, and rice is the, the absolute basis of, of any kind of, uh, well, not just Japanese, but, but many, many um, Asian cultures, right? Um, for in, in Japan, really, the, the, the word gohan means a meal, means dinner, right? So it, it, my, my mom and my grandmother used to say, uh, if we're not having rice, it's a snack, right? It's, it's, not, it's not dinner. So yeah, I mean, um, some might say that I'm a bit food obsessed, that that would be fair, you know, um, members of my family would laugh at that. Uh, um, but I think that there's a there's a kind of um, uh, there's kind of necessity to that. Uh, there are certain things that are part of our culture, and in terms of you know where it's come out in, in my work, I'm, I'm actually working on on new work, uh, and part of it is to incorporate these um, uh, gallon cans of soy sauce that in my family have always been bought the, the Kikkoman cans, highly decorated. Um, Printed cans, and they're, I'm going to be cutting them up and using them as part of it uh, because of uh, you know, the various decorative elements that are on it. Um, but it's always a, it's always a reference to, to sustenance. I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does a little, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, and some part of it, I was fishing a little bit to see what you might be doing next. But it was also whether the aspect of the clothing, because I hadn't seen that used so much in the earlier examples that you gave. But in having been able to have that quilt, it seemed to be, uh, you know, an added wrap, literally and metaphorically. Yeah, it's it's, it's a bit of a, um, it, it's always been a bit of a difficult dif difficulty for me. But I have a tendency to think in terms of built structure. Uh, that, that, that's typical in, in my work. And so, so fabric isn't always something that, that I consider. But uh, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting point. Yep, certainly the form aspect was, uh, was, was very strong within the work and for the added context that you gave. So I'm looking through the chat here to see if we have uh, questions. We do have time on our side. And thanks, Steve, for being uh, timely with your talk to make sure that we, uh, we don't run over as necessary. I so, hope you didn't uh, notice I skipped things. So it's <laughs> like... Uh, okay. So uh, here's a couple of questions. So first up from... Uh, uh, one individual. Um, are the shacks remade or uh, can you resume them? I, I, I think the resume them means like reuse them or, uh, you know, resume the installation from uh, one iteration to the next because you did a great job of highlighting the initial design and the die stamped uh, creation of them. And so, yeah, perhaps you could address uh, um, their longevity from iteration to the next uh, uh, so the, the the original shacks were cut, I think, 2011. So uh, it was a run of 
upwards of 600 shacks and they've been reused and reused and, and any people who some of whom are actually here with us today um, who helped with uh, with the installation can attest that there were some a few that had never been used very stiff and then there were a few that had been used and used again um, that that were beginning to lose their form we ended up patching Quite a number of them just just to get them to stand up so the answer is yes they're they're um they're flattened out and uh stored away and then for the next exhibition they're they're assembled on site yeah great question and i think that it also points towards the conceptual value of your work the notion of yeah the tar paper that your grandfather used uh, and patching from the inside of the actual shack that he was living in and then keeping them together and reusing them from the inside again and also the nature of uh, mobility uh, and the the kind of like forced nomadism or nomadic existence that Japanese Canadians experienced and that you are able to pack these up and then uh, take them and use them again from one place uh, to the next. That's one of the real attractions for me in the, in the conceptual heft for this project. It's a very, it's a very interesting question about that sort of nomadism. Uh, in, and there's, there's an artist in, in Vancouver, I believe, uh, and her name is, last name I think is Shoyama who is doing what she calls a suitcase project, which I think is, is brilliant. She's gone and asked people, um, what would you take if you had 24 hours to pack up everything that you needed to move your family? Mm. Yes. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, the regulations were that you had 150 pounds per adult and 75 per child. Well, you know, uh, I think anybody under 10 is not capable of hauling 75 pounds. Right? And even then, it's a stretch. Okay, hopefully the phone in my background is just going to go off here. But we have another question. So um, apologies for that interruption there. Um, normally, I remember to go around and unplug the phones, but I didn't this time. So um, great question. Um, in Canada and elsewhere, the idea of facing up to past actions of governments and institutions that are now seen to be very bad has become important. What do you see as the best way of approaching these ideas? Um, the difficulty is not always, well, the difficulty happens when it starts to pass out of living memory. So the people who were victimized need to be the first ones consulted, obviously. Right? Um, and you know, there's uh, one of the problems, or one of, one of the advantages of the Japanese Canadian community is that there was a strong political will uh, following the war on the part of some Japanese Canadians to organize uh, the the, the uh, um, some some response to the injustices from the government. It's, it's, it's uh, that kind of political activism is absolutely necessary to, to, to start it off. Uh, without that, um, it starts to disappear from history. Uh, it's, it's very easily forgotten. And in those first few years after the war, there was a very much reluctance in the Japanese community to, to, um, to talk about it. And there remained a kind of reticence uh, um, among Japanese Canadians to, to, to discuss anything to do with it. And I think that there's, there's survivor guilt. There's, there's a kind of, uh, um, somehow it was our fault. You know, we, we stood out too much. You know, if we spread out and we don't speak Japanese, that will be, you know, we'll, we'll be more Canadian. Right? Um, and so, so this resistance to assimilation is, is part of it. Uh, and part of it is is um, to be able to work within the laws and and, and to, to to get the kind of um, acknowledgement and restitution that's um, that's needed. Okay, thanks. Yep, and I uh, am very conscious that we were able to include in the exhibit reference to the documentation for the uh, reparations that were finally uh, approved and paid by the Canadian government uh, to your father. And so 
but I, I think that the first part of your answer that in individual cases making sure that those involved are consulted whereas in this particular instance it was years of lobbying finally uh, decades after by your community that resulted in the uh, in the apology uh, that that came forward so we have a couple of minutes left if there's any other questions um So I have one final uh, rounding point here, and then if anybody is inspired to either stick around or feels more comfortable, uh, uh, you know, with a smaller group at one o'clock, that's fine. Uh, and again, feel free to unmute yourselves, any of you, if you wish. I remember, Steve, from some of our conversations and in the in, in the writing that we were able to pull together, both from your notes and uh, interpretive materials that I um, authored for the exhibition, that one of the drivers for you in work like this is that any family, if they went far enough back in history, would likely find examples of, uh, of oppression and suffering that were perhaps part of their history. And that really struck me as a, uh, as a way of finding a connection for this kind of work that other people might not otherwise uh, uh, you know, do or realize. And so um, I wondered if, uh, if you wanted to comment on that because I always find that you're very measured in your uh, approach to discussing your work. I like how in the talk you talked about at the outset how um, the political nature of your work wasn't something that was first and foremost and, uh, and took a while to, uh, to actually develop. But I, I think this, this contextual point about looking back in history, if one could do far enough that any one family might be implicated in it, it actually ties into that previous question that came from our audience about facing up to uh, actions of the past. And of course, that is what your, uh, your work is about. But I wonder whether part of the, the question and uh, the way that it was posed the last one of um, that governments uh, are you know, confessing or addressing more and more about these things of the past that beyond the example of just Japanese Canadian internment, you know, what scope do you see for, uh, you know, looking at the broader umbrella for other communities that may have, um, you know, been challenged and how we can uh, uh, find work like this that, that taps into those, those other uh, uh, more uh, tawdry or bad histories as they were couched. I think, um... One of, one of the major difficulties uh, for research based work is, is always, you know, finding the information. And it, there was an advantage to, to my doing this work that there was a wealth of information uh, that, that was available that could be sorted through, that could be examined. And um, I think one of the things that I've always tried to do is to produce something which is, um, it, at some level, emotionally effective that that it um, it will speak to a person beyond what their experience is. But maybe it will uh, you know allow them to imagine where they don't have uh, this this kind of an experience in in their uh, in their immediate um, in their in their lives. Right? Um, and so that was that was part of my my point. Um, as far as you know, people going back far enough, they'll find out how how they've been beaten on at some point, and, and I, it's true. I, I believe it, firmly believe that everyone has has been beaten on in some way. Um, the problem is in remembering that experience and in how you react to that experience. As uh, is it uh, is it well. Uh, injustices have been perpetrated on me and my people, and therefore I will uh, now uh, perpetrate them on others. <laughs> that, that gives me the opportunity to do this. Or is it that we'll prevent those things from happening in future? And I, I firmly believe that, that, that that's uh, what I'm trying to do is, is to say, yeah, there's, this is an injustice. I'm, I'm not intending to point fingers. What I'm intending to do is, is to say, Let's not do this. Let's watch out for when it's happening and where it's happening. And I, and I mean, that's now it's happening. So, so the, the, I, I, I don't know if I'm getting a little bit off topic as far as that goes, but um, that's, that's really uh, the, the point of it. 
Yep, definitely an imperative for the work. So um, I'm conscious that we are at time, but there was one last question that did come in about what's next for you. So you mentioned about taking the uh, the Nikomen uh, soy uh, one gallon containers. Um, how, anything you want to share with us, either on the form of what those are going to take or how they adjust the the, the political imperatives there or save that for when it's actually out there? This, this is only just starting. Um, right. It has something to do with uh, some you know, military jargon that happened that comes from um, World War II vintage, but I, okay. I won't say anything more about that. What's what's happening next for um, Ghost Town is uh, I, I've got a, a lead next year. I've been invited to, um, to go to Edmonton and uh, show an iteration at the um, Albert Art Gallery. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That's terrific. Congratulations on that. So without further ado, um, I'd like to offer uh, formal thanks on behalf of the University of Calgary, um, obviously Nickel Galleries and Nickel at Noon, the Founders Gallery at the Military Museums, but more, I think, for everyone that's been here today and the broader community for whom uh, this work uh, really, I think, is uh, incredibly important. So no surprise to me to hear that, uh, that you've got another offering for the work and great to hear that it's... Uh, it's at a major venue. So I um, know that you had a lot of your supporters here as well. So great to see Katie and some of those people that you mentioned that helped put the, uh, the exhibition together. And uh, I will be sticking around for a few more minutes in case there are other individuals that do uh, uh, wish to float any other questions out there. Um, but other than that, yep, I wanna be able to uh, give the note that for uh, next week, we uh, will be hosting Mary Beth Leviolette um, on Honora Brown and the Old Man's Garden. So thank you.